Good afternoon. Uh, today we're here with Chuck DiCarlo of Extrel. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, mass spectrometers and the operations and training. Uh, Chuck is with Extrel. Uh, Extrel's been an elite sponsor of 4C, or I'm sorry, a platinum sponsor of 4C uh, for a number of years. Uh, and so, Chuck, we very much appreciate your uh, time today and uh, doing the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to the audience. And as you know, I'm always really excited uh, to talk to the 4C audience and the 4C community. Um, you know, Extrel, we make gas analyzers that serve a number of different markets. But one of the core values that we have as a company is sustainability. And so for our environmental customers, for our people doing flare gas analysis or fuel gas analysis, um, we always really love to connect with that with that network. Um, I think not only is is being cleaner, being better, and pushing sustainability exciting, but I think it's an area where we always see a lot of innovation, right? Because people always want to find an improved way of going out and, and doing their work, and so it it makes events like the Four Cs, I think, really really engaging and uh, as you said earlier um, there's always something new to learn so hopefully today is going to be right in line with that my personal goal for today's webinar is for everyone to walk away with at least one piece of new information so i'm, I'm hoping we can we can make that happen please do uh, put your questions into the chat window i'm going to try to talk quickly here and leave us some good room at the end to to do some uh, q a so as Steve said, I'm Chuck from Extrel, and today we're going to talk about uh, Extrel mass spectrometers, operation, and maintenance. So we're not going to do anything too too difficult today. I really like operation and maintenance because it's a hand on hands on topic. You know, it's it's a fun uh, kind of a topic. We don't have to get super technical. Uh, we we just want to understand what these devices are and how they work. So I'm going to start off with a real quick intro to what is the mass spectrometer? Uh, some of you, I know, um, Kevin, you've got one that is going to be starting up real soon, and you may have seen some of the uh, systems at some of the uh, other sites, so you might be fairly familiar. I don't know if the full audience has that same level of familiarity, so I'm going to kind of go high level and get you an introduction to that. Then we'll get into operation, and we'll talk about sampling with a mass spectrometer. We'll talk about control. And we'll talk about calibration. And then lastly, we're going to do a crash course in maintenance. So we'll do mass spec maintenance 101. I'm going to try to get everybody the most complete picture I can of mass spec maintenance in the time that's allotted. So uh, we're going to have to move quick, but uh, I know we've got a smart audience, so we can we can we can manage. Just in general, who is Extrel? Uh, Extrel is a company that makes uh, real-time gas analyzers. And we've got the, the experts in place to make gas analysis projects run faster, more safely, more efficiently. Uh, we're located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, you know, there's some unique aspects of the company that enable us to do what we do. Uh, for one thing, we're a relatively old company within the space. 55 years old. We've been in Pittsburgh all that time making mass specs. It's the one analyzer technology that we focus on. And because of that, we have great gas analyzers. Uh, typically, the, the mass spec uh, is for those users who need to get a lot of information about their, their sample. So we'll talk about a little bit how, how it works, but, uh, but typically it's measuring a full speciated composition. So um, in addition to that, you know, we've got proven quality and consistency of manufacturing, provide an outstanding warranty. And of course, we back up all of our products with unparalleled service and support. Now, how do most of you know us? At the four C's and in environmental analysis in general, Extrel's biggest application over the last five years has been flare gas analysis. Mm -hmm. So we got started uh, very actively in the market when the US EPA turned on the refineries and required them to measure uh, H2S and total sulfur 
for subpart JA compliance. Um, we kind of continued to develop our presence within that application when the update to the RSR came around and the EPA required those same refineries to measure BTU content. The mass spec typically was useful to those refineries that wanted to do both of those measurements, or maybe you say all three measurements, H2S, total sulfur, net heating value with one analyzer. And the mass spec gave them a way to do that in real time. It measures that full composition in a few seconds and reports that data very quickly to uh, the refinery and to the, the people controlling the flare. So we'll take a look at what that, what that looks like. But uh, that has been really our biggest application at the four C's and in uh, environmental compliance really over the last five years because of the activity we've seen out of the regulators. It's not the only environmental application people use the mass spec for. We also do fuel gas compliance, looking at sulfurs and H2S. Uh, we do a lot of air monitoring for health and safety as well as compliance. So I, I tend to really get excited about flares and that's what we focused on at 4C. So I, I'll talk a lot about flares today, but but it's not the only application that uh, that it does. So in terms of the the analyzer itself, what does it look like? Well, we got a picture of it here. Uh, you know, typical process analyzer. Usually, you'd see it mounted to the wall of an analyzer shelter, or maybe it's installed outdoors under a three-sided sun hood. Um, it is a continuous gas analyzer, so it's doing an extractive measurement and. We'll talk a little bit about, about that sampling. Um, again, the mass spec in flare, you know, it's it's measuring the the changing composition of the vent gas. So in addition to measuring, you know, your hydrocarbons that are there, methane, ethane, propane, butane, C5 plus, it's it's usually also measuring hydrogen, if there's hydrogen at the site. And if it's a refinery, those sulfurs that I mentioned. So kind of similar to a GC, a lot of people are familiar with process GC, the mass specs giving a speciated measurement where it's recording the concentration of each of those things. And then for the compliance parameters, it's calculating, for example, total sulfur or net net heating value, BTU, it's calculating that from the individual uh, concentrations. Unlike the GC, uh, the mass spec has a, a set dynamic range for all those components. So for every one of the components in the vent gas, it measures from the PPM level, sometimes lower, sometimes PPB, up to 100%. So it was a good fit for flare gas, where depending on what process units dumping to flare, that vent gas can change its composition very rapidly. Uh, I mentioned before that the mass spec does a fast measurement. Uh, typically, we'll say 0.1 second per component. So in a flare sample where we might be measuring anywhere from 10 to 20 things, we're looking at a second to two seconds per update, maybe with some averaging, maybe five or 10 seconds. But we call that a real-time measurement because it's faster than a process GC that might be taking eight minutes or 15 minutes to do that speciated hydrocarbon measurement. Okay. So where does this analyzer really live? If we take a step back and we look at our flare, uh, and again, this is the, a flare example, everything's really starting here in the middle where we've got a, a process unit or some set of process units that are sending gas over to the flare. I mentioned that the mass spec is a continuous gas analyzer, so we've got a, a probe right, inserted somewhere in the line, and of course then that sample gas is coming back in a heated umbilical back to an analyzer shelter, and you can see the mass spec tucked away in there. Really, uh, these flare projects have been fascinating because in addition to being a requirement to report that the EPA has, uh, they also have, in the case of the net heating value, a requirement to uh, control that flare and make sure that for each of the 15 minute required reporting blocks, that flare isn't out of compliance, that it's it's measuring over 270 BTUs per scuff and that it hasn't dropped below that. So typically your, your flare analyzer is also playing a control uh, function. 
by measuring the net heating value and then sending that signal out to a control system that can use mitigation fa uh, uh, techniques like steam injection or supplemental fuel gas to improve that efficiency. So in flare gas, the analyzer gets to report and gets to help with control. It's one reason that the fast analysis of the mass spec uh, has been helpful at, uh, at those sites that, that utilize mass spec. Now, in terms of you know, sample requirements, you know, the, the, the mass spec is very standard in terms of kind of the requirements it has for its sample, much like a process GC or an FTIR. Um, you know, the gas is coming down from, you know, a sample, in this case, from that, that vent header to a sample system where it's usually being fast looped. So we got good fresh sample available at the mass spec. Uh, and then typically we're going to just need about 100 uh, cc's per minute worth of gas coming into this, this gray box on the diagram here is really the mass spec itself. We'll, we'll take a look at these, some photos of these components. And just out of that 100 uh, mils per minute, the mass spec really only takes 10 microliters per minute. So it takes a tiny, tiny amount of gas. The rest of that's all being returned to the flare. And that's the, um, that's the gas that it's really sampling. This is a continuous process. So it's not doing an injection like a GC, but the gas is just flowing, flowing through. Now, if you uh, keep the mass spec happy, or it's a analyzer. So the biggest thing we want to make sure is that we're protecting it from moisture. It's usually the biggest threat uh, our environmental customers, whether that's moisture in the flare, which we almost, most of our flare customers have continuously at least 1% water in that uh, sample stream that's coming in. So we keep everything hot, keep, make sure it's not condensing. Um, there's really a huge pressure range that we can accept for the for the mass spec. Usually, flare samples are around atmospheric pressure, but we can we can take up to 20 psi gauge uh, on that that system. And that flow requirement mostly isn't to feed the analyzer so much as just make sure that we got fresh representative sample available to take our measurement from. Okay. Once it gets into the analyzer, what's a mass spec really doing to, to measure and report? So here I've got a, a diagram of the inside of a mass spec itself. Now, for all of the Strauss history, we focused on one type of technology, and that is quadrupole mass spectrometer. So there's, there's some other types of mass spec out there, but the one we're going to look at today is a quad, and that what that term quadrupole refers to is a quadrupole mass filter. So it's a set of four rods. And I happen to have one here you can look at. And what these do is they allow us to electrically filter molecules as they come into a vacuum chamber. So we're going to look at a vacuum chamber here in just a minute. But, but what's happening with that sample flow, that 10 microliters per minute that goes into the analyzer, is that it is ionized by a device that uh, essentially is a hot filament. So it's kind of kind of like the, the filament in a light bulb, right? When you put a current through it, uh, all these energetic electrons boil off. They ionize the molecules of the sample, which we can then separate with electric charges on the quadrupole. So this is what gives the mass spec its speed. Instead of physically separating things as a result of their chemical properties in a GC column, we're taking everything in at once. So all of it enters the, the vacuum chamber, we ionize it, and then we filter it electrically. That's where the speed comes from. Now, how does the mass spec uh, tell those samples apart? That comes from the way that the molecules react to the ionizer. So when we ionize different molecules, in this case, we're looking at a molecule of methane, it produces a distinct set of ions. And those ions, when we, once we've filtered and scanned them with the mass spec, produce an uh, identifying pattern. This is what they call the mass spectrum. So you see a picture here of the mass spectrum from methane. And it would look different than the mass spectrum of ethane or propane or butane. And this is how the mass spec tells each of these components apart when it's doing its scan.
Okay. So that was a that was a really quick crash course to the intro to mass spec. But what does it really look like, right? This is we're supposed to be talking about operation. So I'm going to move out of the the slide mode and actually let, let's pull up our control software for in this case our Max 300 RTG. Uh, this is the the system that we sold the most to into the refineries and to the chemical plants for doing flare compliance and fuel gas compliance. And again, you see the picture of it here on the software. And this is exactly what the operators of the system would see in the plant. And you can actually see the control software is laid out on a series of tabs, each tab for different modes of operation. So there's you know configuration gets used when we're setting up the analyzer. There's places to look at tuning it and uh, places to set up analysis. But okay, what's the most common place that you're going to look if you're ever in here? Well, let, let's look at data. That's what we care about. Let's look at results. Okay, so I, I mentioned before that the mass spec is doing this electric scanning. It's producing mass spectra. Oh, okay, great. What we need, because we have a flare, is we need quantitative analysis. We need numbers. And so here I've got an example of the kind of data that a flare customer is looking at. So this this is a, a live analysis. It's actually a simulated uh, analysis, but it's it's the software running live. And you can see here in our flare method the types of components that we're measuring. So we're measuring hydrogen, nitrogen, methane, ethane, propane, butane, C5 plus. These are by no means the exclusive compounds that we measure at flare customers. Uh, we've got some flares that are measuring 25 or 30 components. You know, maybe 12 sulfurs, 18 hydrocarbons. The the level of detail and the level of speciation that the site uh, needs to see is usually determined by the set of regulations that they need to comply with, and also then their interest perhaps in identifying, you know, using those uh, compounds to identify what's going on within their process units. So this would be a fairly simple example of a flare. Um, in addition to looking at, you know, my individual components, I've also added some calculated parameters here. So I've got a total sulfur parameter, and I've got a net heating value parameter. And again, those are just calculated from the concentrations of the speciated components in the mix. That analysis is all built here on my analysis tab. And uh, once you uh, create an analysis, actually on any analyzer, you can create as many analysis files as you want. So you can have different analysis files for different samples. If you had two flares that you could put both samples to the same mass spec, but they had different process units. That analyzer could have a vast, uh, vastly different method for looking at flare A compared to flare B. It's got a lot of flexibility in that regard because with the mass spec, you never change the hardware around just because you have new components to measure. Those changes are all made in, in the software. Once I've created an analysis method, I can actually do some automation. So I mentioned that uh, you know, maybe I've got two flares. Well, in this case, I can create a sequence where I look at my first flare. Then maybe I'll add a step, and I'll, I'll call this flare B. And I'll pick my method, flare gas method. I'll pick my valve. I'll say OK. And now all I have to do is hit the play button, and I'll oh, I, the software is giving me a warning. It's to make sure you save save my my new sequence. I hit the flare button, and now it'll run an automated sequence where it'll just look for 30 minutes at the first flare, 30 minutes at the second flare. So, real simple uh, automation tools built right into the software. Okay, so there we have operated a mass spec. Now. It goes farther than that, though, right? Because I talked about we want to do sampling. What else do we need to know uh, to keep that mass spec going? And what else do we need within that shelter? OK, so in terms of utilities, uh, the mass spec's pretty straightforward. Of course, we need power. 
Uh, you know, the vacuum chamber requires pumps, so we typically don't run them on uh, batteries. Um, and then most often within refineries and chemical plants, we've also got a requirement for hazardous area certification. And so class one div two uh, units, they would also use per gas. Beyond that though, we don't really have any other uh, continuous uh, consumed utilities. So there's no carrier gas, there's no detector gases required. So it's relatively straightforward in that sense, no changing out carrier gas bottles. The data that you saw in the software, uh, of course, usually doesn't just live there. For most of our Flare users, they need that data to go into a DAS uh, system or they want it to go into their DCS. A lot of times they want it to go into both places, so they've got it all organized for reporting, but that they also have it for the control of the Flare or for doing alarms in the case of an air monitoring mass spec. So, of course, we've got a number of different ways to communicate, whether that be Modbus or, you know, analog 4 to 20s, digital outputs of some sort. One thing I will mention just real quickly, um, you know, kind of a pro tip for, for those of you who, you know, you've got a set of operators who really love the DCS and they're used to the DCS environment. Uh, we've got the ability to configure the software to take all of its commands directly from the DCS. So start and stop analysis, start and stop calibration. That way, your operators don't have to leave the DCS programming to control the mass spec. So that option exists as well. Now, calibration and validation. Right? This is, of course, a really hot topic when we get to flare applications, because not only do we want to make sure our analyzer is accurate, but the regulators have usually told us that there's a schedule that we have to maintain uh, for keeping that analyzer accurate. Typically, when we talk about mass spec and compliance applications, we will talk about validation and calibration as, as being two different things. Uh, the validations are the calibration checks that are written right into the into the rules. And you know, in the U.S. and in Canada, there is for the the flare systems a daily, uh, weekly, and or sorry, daily, quarterly, and typically annual requirement for doing validations. Um, you know, under different regulations or different site uh, procedures, we see other um, other frequencies that occur as well. Um, calibration itself, as far as a manufacturer recommendation, is typically recommended for twice per year. So in a flare, following the standard maintenance procedures, we would recommend that uh, the analyzer be recalibrated. So once it's six months, once at 12 months. Flare gas, surprisingly, depending upon the site and the flares, can be a really clean application in terms of what the mass spec sees. So in some cases, they might extend that calibration frequency out if they extend their maintenance to one year. Those are the kinds of things that people learn once they get the analyzer on their flare and run it for a while. Typically, uh, each calibration step is going to flow gas for a minute or two. I mentioned before that we, we really request 100 cc's per minute of gas. So any given calibration or validation step requires a couple hundred cc's. You know, I say 500 on the slide. It's probably a conservative assumption. So just a couple hundred cc's of uh, atmospheric cow gas. So we're really consuming a very small amount of gas when we do a calibration. Uh, what would a calibration look like? Let's, let's go back to our software. So I've got a, a data table here that I, I configured for our flare, but let me start my flare method again. I'll just go back and hit the, the play button. Let's imagine I wanted to check the accuracy of the analyzer. In this case, I've got another display set up where I can just compare the, the live reading right to in this case, I've imagined that I'm, I'm analyzing a bottle of uh, cow gas mixed together, right? So I've got one of my calibration gas bottles here, and I'm looking at it and comparing the results to the C of A. Um, you know, 
not only would this be the kind of check that would be automated for validation for compliance sake, but this is the same kind of thing that you'd have to check, right? If you got a call out in the middle of the night, somebody called you up and said, hey, you know, we want to check the analyzer. We got a funky reading. We want to see if it's if it's doing the right thing. One of the features that I, I like to make sure that our users are aware of is the fact that this software is a web page that's accessible from anywhere on the plant network. So as long as your plant, as long as your personnel have the right permissions and your network is set up for it, you know, you could log in from home and come in and check these validation numbers and maybe save yourself a trip to site in the middle of the night, uh, which you know, I, I don't really like getting out and driving somewhere in the middle of the night if I can avoid it. Um, in this case, I look at my numbers and I see, okay, it looks like nitrogen's reading a little bit high, maybe methane's a little bit low. Uh, I decide I want to do a recalibration. I would do that right here back on my analysis tab. So each analysis method has its own cal procedure. And for a mass spec, there's a couple of different cal types. So there's backgrounds, fragments, sensitivity. In this case, I'm going to do a sensitivity step to align my, my reading. So I'll come in and I'll hit the play button for the sensitivity calibration. And the software asks me, do you sure you want to run it? I say, yes, please run the calibration. OK, so it runs the calibration and it's come up with new parameters. And it, it actually lets me check those over. You can also automate it to do uh, checking on its own if you include your calibration as part of a, a sequence. So, um, but in this case, I've got it set up. It's going to give me a, a manual check. And I'll accept those numbers. And it tells me, OK, the analysis method is saved. The changes are applied to the system. And it goes right back into its analysis. And so now I go to my uh, validation chart and I look and I see, OK, my numbers are now, they're aligned a little bit closer. They're looking a little bit better. Actually, this isn't, being that it's uh, the simulator, I'm surprised at how good, how good it is because I can see a little bit of a, a deviation there. Uh, but we don't have a real analyzer, so we can't really do a real good uh, analysis and, and cal. But, but this gives us a, a good example for the sake of our our crash course today. And so there you have an example of a calibration step. Typically within Flare, there's going to be some series of calibration steps. And depending upon the number of um, speciated hydrocarbons that the site wants to see, there could be some set of calibration gases that uh, would be more than you would look at, say, with a with a, a GC on this similar application. That's because the mass spec uses a kind of calibration we call the fragment calibration. And it's what enables the mass spec to tell apart compounds that have similar mass uh, spectra. So the fragment cal uh, is what gives the analyzer the numbers that it needs to do that fast speciated analysis. So with the mass spec, you end up with a, a few extra calibration bottles, but the payoff is the speed at which the controllers and the operators get your data. And as I mentioned, those bottles are only going to be used once or twice per year. So there's, there's not a lot of cow gas that gets consumed as a result. Now, if I jump back into the slide pack, I wanted to make a quick note on the validation uh, procedures. So as I said before, these are what the, the regulators are requiring. And you can see some examples of the most commonly used uh, validation gases. And this really actually goes across not just mass spec users, but GC users. So most of the refineries and chemical plants that are out there doing heating value validations are using these three mixes. And anyone who's interested, of course, you can get a copy of the presentation or you email me and I can send you uh, examples of these blends. Uh, it, they're great blends. They're stable. Uh, the regulators approve of them and they 
provide a straightforward way to calibrate. For the those of you who were at refineries and need to do sulfur calibrations, um, the requirements are a bit more difficult. They're usually uh, based on historic uh, high sulfur high sulfur levels that have been reported. And as a result, they can lead to a situation where a refinery might have to have high percent H2S bottles present for doing daily calibrations. That's a dangerous thing. And one of the things that mass spec users have done is to develop amps that enable them to move forward without having to use those high concentration H2S bottles. So if any of you were to find yourself in a site that is saddled with that kind of a requirement, let me know, and that's something we can talk about, You know how you might be able to alleviate that risk. Um, again, we don't want our compliance analyzer to be more dangerous you know, to our personnel than you know, the flare itself. Okay, we got a little bit of time here still for maintenance, right? And now I'm in my basement, as you can probably see, you know, looking, looking around me here. Um, but I still wanted to give you kind of the feel for, for hands-on maintenance as much as possible. So I've got a couple of videos here and I've got, you know, as I did before, I've got some show and tell pieces. So we're going to, we're going to try to do a, a crash course in mass spec maintenance. And I'm going to start with where we left off with a picture of the analyzer. Uh, when we want to work on it though, we've got to get inside there. So I'm going to show you a video. The front panel of the analyzer is a door. Okay, and it, it's got uh, actually five uh, locks on that door. We can disengage those with a screwdriver. And once you've done that, inside, you'll see all the components of the mass spec. In fact, this, this kind of silver tube right here in the middle is the vacuum chamber that I mentioned. This is a roughing pump. This is the pump that pumps out that vacuum chamber. Actually, it's one of two pumps. The first step, though, to getting to this is to slide that whole analyzer out of the enclosure. So right now I'm loosening up the inlet. Once I've loosened the inlet and disengaged the locking bracket, the analyzer actually slides out on what we call the vac track. We want everything to be as exposed and accessible as possible when we go to do maintenance. And so once we've done that, okay, here we've got our mass spec with the vac track extended, and you can see uh, the gas, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the gas analyzer itself is mounted right there. Now, this slide actually gives us a complete summary of the maintenance procedures on the system. The biggest one and most important one, we'll start in the upper left-hand corner here, is that we need to change the oil in that pump twice per year. And it's a very straightforward process. Actually, you can see here the drain plug hangs off the front, uh, and you got the fill port right at the top. There's a sight glass here, obviously for checking the, the health of the oil and, and checking the fill level. So twice per year, you pull the drain plug, drain the oil, put it back, and pour new oil in and fill that up. Now, once per year, in the case of flare, maybe more in some of your dirtier applications, we would also want to do internal maintenance and get into that vacuum chamber. Okay, and there's two main components to that internal maintenance. So we're going to look at both of those. One, we're going to we're going to change that device that I mentioned before, that ionizer. You know, in many years ago, back when I started at Extrel, I was a service tech. And I would travel around to our customer sites and I would work on the analyzers that have been installed, some of them 20 years before. And at that time, the ionizer wasn't a disposable component. At that time, you took it apart and you did all kinds of cleaning, little tiny. There's nothing anymore. That hasn't been the case since, uh, since really the analyzers that were coming out 12, 15 years ago. And so I'll show you what it is to replace the ionizer. And then when the second procedure is to clean that quadrupole that I mentioned, to clean the mass filter. Okay, so what does it take to get in there to work on that? Let's let's take a look at an example here of, of 
getting inside the vacuum chamber. So we've slid out the vac track, and now on uh, this side of that chamber, we've got our ionizer flange. Okay, so remember we've got moisture in our sample, so we keep it hot. So the first step, you know, you want to have your gloves on, protect your hands. We remove the heater, well, first the insulator jacket, and then we'll get to the heater from that ionizer flange. So I'm just disconnecting a thermocouple connector, and I'll unplug the heater for the inlet, and then I'll unplug the ionizer heater itself. And then I'll disconnect the 10 pin connector. So that's really the all the voltages for controlling the ionizer go through that cable. Put that aside. And now I'll get an Allen wrench and I'll use that to take off the heater itself. And we'll skip ahead in the video because you don't want to watch me fumble with little screws. Now I'm going to remove the inlet. Now pay attention to this. The inlet, you already saw me connect one side of it from the heater, or I'm sorry, from the sample selector box. The other place that it connects is there at the flange. So a three quarter inch wrench, you break that fitting, and now the inlet is removed. We're going to come back to that in, in, in a minute. We'll talk about the inlet again. Well, once I've done that now, my ionizer flange is ready to go. Now you can see there's eight uh, screws that hold that on. But once I remove those, and I'm going to actually move out of screen sharing mode, what I get is this. This is our ionizer flange. So here's the port where the, I pulled the inlet out. There's the 10-pin the connector. And this is the component inside the vacuum chamber that's generating the ions. Now, when I want to replace that, I pull that off. And it, we call it disposable. You can throw it away. Most people actually take it, put it on the shelf, and they keep it as a backup in case they would ever need another one. Um, the, there are the filaments that I mentioned that do all the ionizing are mounted right in there. What you do with your new one is you take and you pop it on, and this is ready to go back into the mass spec. But before we put it in, we want to continue, right? Because I mentioned there's a second component to our internal maintenance. Oh, yeah, here's a slide showing the ionizer. Uh, that second component is cleaning the mass filter, the quadrupole. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so I've got my ionizer flange out. Now I'm going to remove what we call the RF flange. That's the flange that has the leads that put the power onto the quad. And there's a set screw for, for keeping the quadrupole from moving around inside the chamber. Um, mostly used during shipping because nothing moves in the mass spec once it's operating other than the pumps. Once the set screw is out, I'm reaching inside. Now I'm going to just extract the quad from the chamber itself. And usually, you kind of you got to be gentle with it. Maybe wiggle it a little bit uh, as it's as it's sliding out. Unfortunately, you can't you can't use any lubricants uh, because inside a vacuum chamber, those would just off gas forever. So everything in there is steel and ceramic. And there is the quadrupole. Now in the video, I'm, I'm wearing gloves, and the reason for that really is to uh, keep the oils from my hands from building up on the surfaces of the quad. So typically, once you pull that off, you'd keep your gloves on. And then I mentioned you, you wash it. How do you wash it? This is, this is the tool I use. It, it's a toothbrush. And what you do is you literally take it to the a sink there at the plant, um, put it underwater, and then using a toothbrush and a detergent, we, we provide a detergent, it's Alkanox, uh, usually mixed with pumice for a little bit of abrasive. And you'll come in and you clean all the surfaces of the quad, rinse it under water. Last thing we do is we hit it with a degreaser to take any extra oils, rinse it again, dry it really well, and 
that quad is done. It's ready to go back into the system. Uh, everything goes back together. You know, the reverse of, of what we just uh, we just saw in the videos. Oh, the video starting again. Okay, and so now we've seen the full yearly maintenance, right? Which is to change to clean the quad, change the ionizer, put that all back together. Ah, I forgot to mention one other place where we will look to do some maintenance is in the sample selector box itself. So uh, this is a component that doesn't get much stress at a flare because usually the flare analyzer is sitting on one sample all the time, you know, unless you're running your validation gas through your sample selector, which some sites do. Um, but I've got a sample selector head right here. Uh, so if you see that that component that was on the slide, uh, here's an example of what that looks like. And once a year, we would go in and we would replace the rotor seal. So the front of that screws off, and there's a little seal component that kind of pops out. So that's something we would replace that once per year when we do the same maintenance on the chamber. And that assures that the, uh, the seal surface doesn't get scored and cause any crosstalk between your valve positions. And once we've done that, you've done a full mass spec maintenance. Now, okay, so that, that's all well and good, right, for the standard maintenance, but I'm sure people are also thinking, well, what happens when things go wrong? And typically, the, the biggest risk to the analyzer, I mentioned it before, if, if you were paying attention, is moisture. Because we've got a gas analyzer, uh, it, it doesn't have any problem with water vapor. It can analyze water vapor all day long. But if we get condensation in the lines in front of the, the mass spec and we got liquid droplets coming down, those can plug up that inlet component that we saw in the video. I got one of those here too. I'm like Johnny Cash in uh, uh, the song, One Piece at a Time, where he steals a Cadillac from the, I got, I got one piece of the mass spec, one piece at a time. So and here's, here's that inlet kind of up close. And you might be able to see in the video, I don't know if I, maybe if I hold a piece of paper in front of it, uh, you might be able to see that there is a few silica capillary. That that glass tube that looks like a hair that's coming out of the end of that, that's actually our our sample tube. And so it does a great job of protecting the inside of the mass spec uh, from anything that's upstream, but it will plug if water droplets get down there. And if that does happen, then the way to, to fix it really is to take this component and replace it, put a new inlet on. And you saw, I mean, it, it connects two compression fittings. One of these was in the sample selector. The other one was the one you saw me take off of the inlet flange. So it only takes a minute to replace. Um, you know, the, the downside to having your inlet plug is that you don't have any gas coming in to give you a sample. But the silver lining is, it protects the internal components of the mass spec from what, whatever is in that liquid. So whether that's you know water and hydrocarbons or water and HF acid, who knows what what could be coming out of the process units, it all really gets uh, contained within that within that inlet. Um, right along with that, within the sample selector itself, each sample position has a little two micron frit filter um, that is you know kind of a last means of resort to try to protect the analyzer from liquid breakthrough. If there was to be a plugged inlet, typically you'd find that this frit filter is also plugged up and that would be that would be replaced just by there's might be able to see it's pretty small, but it, it's inside this filter body. So you just take this fitting off and dump the filter out, put a new one in. Okay. Well I mentioned that was going to be a crash course. Um, 
But I think we did it. I think we got through at a high level uh, what we're using the mass spec for in flare gas and in fuel gas compliance. We talked about sampling with the mass spec and it, what it needs. We talked about operating and calibrating. And then we, we went over each of the critical maintenance steps. I think we still have maybe a minute or two for questions. Um, I haven't been looking at the I haven't been looking at the chat crawler, so I don't know, Steve, did anyone enter anything? I'm so sorry. No, no. <laughs> I was so enraptured by your presentation, Chuck, I didn't <laughs> need to go look at the chat line. <laughs> no, but that was awesome. That was really, really cool. That is a beautiful encapsulation. Um, and yeah, I think it dispels, you know, the idea that the uh, mass spec, uh, you know, while the the uh, the math behind it may be complicated and the inner workings may be complicated, the actual maintenance and operations is uh, quite simple. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it it's nice in that there's there's not a lot to it. I mean, you, you basically in the course of our talk, right? We we looked at all of the components. Um, you know, it's an electrical device which means there's not a lot of moving things. There's not a lot of little you know, bits and pieces to, to really break, um, which makes it good for working on. Um, yeah. and it's very helpful when you took the thing apart because so, you can see all the individual components and it's not really a mystery now. It's right there. Uh, so that was fantastic. That was really, really cool. That was an awesome presentation. Um, uh, Michael Miller agrees that that was a great Prince presentation. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Appreciated the uh, anatomical breakdown, being able to see it component by component. And uh, uh, it really gives you a better understanding of how it works, too, when you, when you get to see the individual pieces. Uh, that was fantastic. That's the first time I've seen that, and that is uh, that that was really really special. Um, so with that, well, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, Steve, I was going to say, um, at four C's, the a, a much better version of of this same presentation uh, has has been taught in the uh, the Wednesday session the last two years, where where we had uh, I guess four hours, and so. The last couple of years, we had a mass spec there, and they got to take it apart right there in the room and let everybody kind of see and, and you know handle all the components. Yeah. You were probably too busy to attend that session uh, with the show going on, but uh, maybe this year, come check it out. Oh, I definitely will. I love it. Yes. Unfortunately, there's um, 17 presentations going on at a time, so I don't I don't get to go to nearly as many as I would like, which is why I love this webinar series so much because I get to see and learn all of what's in there. And yes, in a four hour course, uh, you get to dig into more details, ask more questions. Uh, and so yes, the that four hour course will be again at the show this year, uh, August 18th to the 20th. Um, and Yes, we invite you all to attend the, the 4C uh, conference, Austin, Texas, uh, August 18th to the 20th. Um, and yes, there's a great lineup again this year, uh, about a 35 training classes. And uh, this year we will only have about 110 presentations because we're going to extend the presentation time to 45 minutes to allow for more question and answer. That's some of the feedback we've gotten. We'd had 30 minute slots, which only allows, you know, 20 minutes and then five minutes to get to and from. So it's just a little too rushed. So this year we're going to have 45 minute slots. And then also on the that's on all day Thursday, Wednesday afternoon, there will also be presentations. Wednesday morning is all training Friday uh, morning, Friday afternoon training. <clears throat> and uh, this is a fantastic class. Very, very much appreciated. And yes, if they would like the four hour version, uh, come to the 4C conference. 
Um, and yeah, and, and Chuck also, we very much appreciate your support for the conference. You've been very, very supportive, helping develop the content, uh, helping, uh, you know, working with Troy Boley and developing the, uh, the flare, uh, the really the flare curriculum. Uh, it's a really a three day curriculum with training on Wednesday, presentations on Thursday and additional training on Friday. So it's a really wonderful. Uh, uh, I have gone through the flare expert slides. I've not been able to attend the class in the last four years. Of course, I attended the class when it was developed uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the neat thing I, I think about about that, you know, endeavor, you know, really kind of combining, you know, as you mentioned, Troy and, you know, the regulatory expertise that, you know, his uh, company, you know, Spectrum that they bring to the table, uh, combining that with the the DAS people, with the analyzer people, you know, it was a, really a collaboration, not only at the four C's, but the, a collaboration that then extended and occurred in the field when we were encountering, you know, these same people out at the refineries and we're encountering them, you know, now in the, the chemical plants. And it's like, I got to, you know, we all together, I got to watch things evolve from, you know, the JA era, you know, five plus years ago, when people were scratching their heads about what are we going to do about this type of sample? Or what are, you, what are we going to do about HF acid? What are we going to do about validation in the rule? To the point where now, you know, we're moving into EMACT and MONMACT. And it's like, yeah, we did it at the refinery. You know, like, it's all, we, we, we got all the answers. It's all there. It's worked out. And, uh, yeah, to, to then go and see those same people at the Four Cs and just see how it's all come together over the past several years, it's really been enjoyable. Yeah, the the Four C stands for connect and collaborate and contribute to compliance. And uh, I wish I could take credit for it, uh, but one of our staff came up with that uh, after the, the third conference. And, you know, while we had a vision of, you know, bringing these people together, and it was really the exhibitors that came to me uh, back when I worked for a prior company and asked me to to kind of uh, to to bring this community together and and have a conference that uh, you know where I had background, so I kind of knew who to bring in and how to put a set of presentations together. But I never realized how tight of community we would end up building where these people that worked in these separate silos previously, even me included, I did a lot of air permitting work. I did a lot of B1 work, um, but I didn't really understand uh, the equipment side, the vendor side, how, you know, the importance of the maintenance, the the importance of having the right instrumentation, the calibration gases, all of it, how it all, it all ties together. And the conference uh, has been really fantastic in that way. And, you know, I realized that it's all of the exhibitors and sponsors that bring their expertise to bear. That's what makes it valuable that, uh, you know, you'd never get to learn this type of information uh, just in casual encounters that you that we used to have, you know, at at uh, at other conferences where they had maybe presentations, but not this full curriculum. And you know, I can't take credit for putting those curriculums together. That was where all of all of you got together and collaborated to put together this really cool curriculum on flares and on Eldar and B1 and RSR and fence line monitoring. And uh, you get to see how all the different pieces tie together, um, not just in the 30 to 45 minute bite sized presentations, which are super valuable, but also with the four hour training sessions, as you mentioned, with the four hour training class, you really get to spend more time with it. And, you know, it's not one or the other. It's really when they work best, when they're in a complement and not just one vendor, but the whole, the whole, uh, 
the whole value chain of stakeholders uh, all collaborating. And it doesn't end at the conference. It's really a conference is the starting point yeah. for that collaboration until the next year. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's really, really kind of a beautiful thing to see. And of course, I very much appreciate you doing this today. I appreciate you helping put together that curriculum over the years, bringing the, the various stakeholders uh, in a in a collaborative environment. And you mentioned the open mic on uh, Thursday afternoon, and that's a that's a time where the chemical folks get to ask the refinery folks, "Hey, what did you?" What, what should we be looking out for? What did you learn? How, how about this particular situation? And, you know, uh, you had shared the uh, really refreshing collaborative uh, exchange that you had last year where chemical companies getting to ask refining companies and, and uh, sharing lessons learned and, and uh, preventing people from retracing the same steps uh that that is just so so refreshing and so beautiful to hear and of course you know you're a very big part of that chuck i i, I know <laughs> i just get to be the guy that um you know kind of facilitates and fosters but you're it, it, it's your involvement uh to the community to the to the industrial and the regulated community uh to help educate them and to help foster uh that collaboration so thank you very very much we we certainly appreciate uh, all that you do chuck oh i appreciate the chance to talk to you today and thanks to everybody who uh joined the conversation um if, if there are questions i guess subsequent to this i know steve you're going to make the recording available but uh, you know contact me at extrel if you have questions about flares or mass specs or whatever you know I, okay. I, i'm available as well all right thank you very much jack and that concludes the uh recording today okay thanks steve hey guys i really appreciate your time thanks chuck thanks steve for uh, putting this together and uh great great presentation yeah uh, kevin hopefully that i mean that was a really fast kind of dip through it